Welcome back, everybody. Today, I'm glad to announce the new expansion of the Loki workflow pack. So anything that I'm using, any tools I'm using related to the face swapping, are going to go into Loki. All right. Um, and we've got some really cool new features to show you. So this one is going to be Mimic Motion. I just want to give full credit to Kijai. Uh, Kijai is the guy that wrote the wrapper for Live Portrait. He's got the wrapper for Mimic, Mimic Motion. He's also done a bunch of other stuff. If you use KJ Node, Supia, we're a big fan of Supia. He also did the Marigold wrapper, I think, and a couple, there it is, and a couple of others. So yeah, an IC light as well, which was in the last video. Where we go, there it is. So this guy's really a hardworking man. So give him some support if you're able to. His name is, like I said, it's Kijai. And you'll find him on GitHub. We're going to be taking a look at the Mimic Motion wrapper. So this is actually pretty straightforward and we have no time. So very simply, what you do is you download all of the uh, files that we need, right? So this, these, this is the structure that you're going to put inside your um, diffusers. So it's actually a lot easier than it sounds. So for example, I'll just show you mine. So right here, I've got the XT 1.1 safe tensors, which you find in the base of the folder right there. It's that one. That one is going to go into uh, this folder in the root of diffusers. But then when you go inside here, this is a clone of the, the rest. OK, so what I did was I cloned the whole thing um, and you'll notice there's a preprocessor there. There's a thing in a model here. It's the FP16 one. The scheduler, same thing. Going to the unit, same thing. Another model there. And this is stable diffusion uh, image to video XT1.1. There's a VAE in there as well. All right. And then obviously the model index. And then if we go back up one, the that file, which is this one. So I copied the whole thing into my diffusers made sure all of the file names were matching the pattern, which is shown just here. These are the files you need. They'll be there. And then putting the other folder, the, 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 other, the main model in the root of diffusers. And then the last thing you have to do is download his Mimic Motion pruned. And I took the 1.1 version. And like I said, if I just go back to models, Mimic Motion, see, I made a folder, Mimic Motion, threw the bad boy in there. Now, this is a lot of extra models to download. But when you consider that we're going to be doing open open pose control net with SVX, SVDXT, that's pretty big because we've always done it with, you know, 1.5, 2.1, SDXL. We've not seen many implementations of this that are not just animated diff using the base 1.5. So this is a pretty big jump forward. And uh, I can imagine that more fine-tuned models are going to, um, you know, exploit this to to the same or effect anyway so now we've got all of our models in the right place we need to do one more thing now don't be afraid it's actually really easy if we go back to the comfy ui portable folder so that would be where you normally start your portable installation from so not in comfy and not in python what you want to do is get into a terminal here now for me i can just right click open in terminal but you might not have that on your windows so essentially, you want to go into this directory in the command line, and then you want to copy this line. And this is the same line. So if you ever need to do a manual install of a comfy node, and it has a requirements.txt, it's this is the command executed from here. So if this is your comfy, it's one folder above it, OK? And um, you run this, and like I said, it, this works for any custom node with a requirements.txt. You just need to use the correct folder name, and you can do a manual installation like this. This is the exact command you need, so it's worth drawing attention to. All right, so now we've got our uh, diffusers, and we've got our Mimic Motion model. I just got the um, Mimic, Mo Mimic Motion merged unit 1.1 FP16. That's the one I took. Once you've done that, you can then run over to Loki where there will be a new version which will contain 8 and 12, but it will also have the new Mimic Motion workflow. And then we can take a look at the workflow. Now, this is actually a version of Trio, 
just because I wanted to show you, yes, we have just generated the image as well. Okay, so uh, this is the usual trio stack with the soup here turned on. We'll turn that off for now. Um, what I've done is I've changed the empty latent image so that it matches the video source that we're going to do. And then I've used the uh, a, a, another image I generated as the guide for my control net. All right. And then basically we just run that one through. And we end up with this woman here. And then we obviously are going to do a reactive face swap. Now, I don't think... No, I am. I'm using a model. So I'm using a Thora V1 model, which we trained with Loki uh, face, face swap. So there it is. So we've got our reactor face model, and it's going to swap over her face. Okay. And, and then I'm also doing a face restore as well, which kind of tidies up the image a bit. And then I was doing this. This has been replaced. We don't use a law segmentation now. We've got something quicker. And then I upscaled it, right? Just so it gets a bit more detail. And then I've thrown that in here. Now, this is the dynamic motion workflow. Uh, dynamic motion? See, there's been so many of them, I get them mixed up. This is mimic motion. Now, what have I done to it? Because I've basically reordered it, all right? I've given you some instructions. We've got the link to the video. We've got the link to the workflow. We've got the link to the nodes, the link to the models, everything we've already talked about. Now, as with the live portrait, I've done the fix. So, you know, it's taking the frame rate of the source video and then it's driving the final animation with the audio. So that means that if you want the audio from the video, it's going to be kept and in sync. Okay. Next thing is I'm not saving these previews. They're just there so you can see. This was the de the uh, pose estimation it did of the clip. And then here is the first output. Now, something I'm doing is I'm doing, as recommended by the author, select every nth two. Now, that's going to give you half frame rate. So what I've done is I've plugged it into film or rife. It's up to you which one you want to run. I find that film runs great on my system, but some people told me that rife ran with less memory. So if you can't quite squeeze film in, you could try rife. The other ways is to reduce the number of frames or the size of the uh, animation. So I'm trying to keep things at 1024 by 576 or rather 576 by 1024, which is what gives us this vertical aspect ratio, right? So before I talk about the driver video, because a lot of people ask questions about this, what is this doing? If I select this, it's going to make sure that no video has a longer dimension than 1024 when it gets to the interpolation stage, all right? Um, if I do this, it's going to use film. If I do this, it's going to use rife, okay? That's all it is. And as you can see, we've got them being uh, bypassed or used. Don't use them both because it'll mess up the synchronization. Although, and it'll look bad, but just so you know, if you were going to use both of them, you'd have to put it on four, right? And then that means that three frames are going to be just estimated. It's not a good idea. You want to have it on two. One gives the most accurate. Uh, so no in So if you have no interpolation, right? If we disable the interpolation, and we say, um, okay, we're going to just do, um, we're just going to do select every one nth. So I've explained it all here for you guys. And we're going to talk about the frame cap and stuff in a second. But I just wanted to explain that frame cap one, no interpolation. Frame cap two, which obviously takes half as long. Yeah, because the interpolation is much, much quicker than cooking every single frame. So I tend to use a combination of film uh, with uh, select every nth two, and then we're going to let film restore every other frame when we get to the other end. Now, it's less accurate, but it makes less mistakes because sometimes the diffusion is able to make mistakes. And if you have half as many generations, there's half, as ch half the chance to get it wrong. But then again, you're relying quite heavily on the interpolation. So this could make some mistakes too. Um, I've got it down to, let's see, when I did my testing, 600 frames I could handle in one go on a 4090. That took 22 gigabytes of VRAM and it took 2000 seconds. Now, 600 frames at 30 FPS is about 20 seconds of video. 
So if you want to make the job easier, cut it in half. Do it in 10 second segments. So 300 frames, right? That's 10 seconds of video. Um, it's still going to be the full 30 FPS at the end because of the interpolation if you have it active, but that's 1,000 seconds and 16 gigabytes of RAM. Um, I did try lowering it down to 150, so you're doing five seconds per batch. Um, but again, it still took 1,000 seconds, and it's still about 12.9 gigabytes of uh, VRAM. So you're going to have to reduce either the dimensions of what you're animating or doing smaller batches. But there's like a lower limit where you don't really get any more gains from just doing a smaller job. And I think that's because that's how many models are actually loaded to make it work. So you can't really save it because it's <laughs> that's the, the sort of flaw. Um, but I'm sure there's ways of doing it. Right. So last thing I wanted to talk about before I go through my list and make sure I didn't miss anything, is this. Now, this is super important. A lot of people were asking about this. So, force rate, don't worry about it. I'm feeding the frame rate into the end video. So, whatever you put in here will automatically try to match at the other end. So, obviously, low frame rate video on the driver will make low frame rate, rate video on the output, and it should be a little bit less memory as well. So I'm running 30 frames per second on this, and I'm going straight to 30. Uh, we halve it so that it makes it a bit easier. But this is the, the main thing I wanted to talk about here, the frame load cap. So this is how many frames it's going to do in one job, right? Now, on my computer, I found I could do 600, but it took 2,000 seconds. That's quite a long time, right? So you're probably going to go away and do something else. Now, you would probably start it like this at zero. So then when that one job has been queued, all you do is you type, type 600 here and then queue it again. And then you type 1200 and queue it again. And you repeat until you reach the end of your source clip. All right. Now, obviously, if your PC is a little bit weaker, you probably want to try 300 first. Okay. And you want to start at zero and then you would go up in multiples of 300. Queue it again. Then you go to 600, queue it again, you know, then 900, queue it again. That's how you operate this. So if you were to say frame load cap zero, which is what some of my workflows come with, it's just going to try and do the whole thing. Okay. And obviously if you put like a movie in there, <laughs> you're probably going to bake your computer. So you want to keep an eye on how long the video is that's being put in as the driver video, right? And like I said, the way I mitigate that is I just put a, I try 300, then I try 600. And just FYI, I've got a good PC, 4090 installed. If I run 1200, I hit a CPU bottleneck where I have to restart the computer. Because it's not the generation, it's just the processing of the, the, the job. It just can't do it. It just uh, grinds to a halt, Okay. Now, you might not have such a CPU bottleneck if you have, like, a brand-new PC, but it's definitely noticeable on a one- to two-year-old PC. Um, it's not the GPU's fault at that point. You see what I mean? It's not the GPU's fault. Um, okay, so this is almost done now. So what we've actually done, I think I asked it to give me uh, three uh, 300. I think it was from 300. So any second now, we should get the rife. And look, as you can see, it kind of has a bit of a hard time it's keeping background stable sometimes. So that's pretty nasty, actually. Um, but it definitely is better now I've got the uh, aspect ratio matching. So here we go. Should be popping up any second now. Oh, man, there's a lot of stuff. So we got to get the background under control. And this is one of the reasons why what I want to do is I want to isolate this, get them out. You know, I want to get them out of there and use the body instead. This is going to be like a comfy UI replacing the puppet process of character animator. Because if you can get a body to just move around according to a driver video, we can put a head on that. Um, but there'll be more... There'll be more coming. Like I said, this is going to be our little face swapping toolkit. And the way I see it is 
this mimic motion fits in really well with the other tools in the tool set. So I made a few small changes, nothing that you won't have seen before if you've had some of my previous workflows. Um, so definitely go ahead and enjoy this one. Um, I should have been playing the, uh, you know, the results a few times. So you've got a good idea, but it's all about a nice clean driver video and a nice, uh, probably like you don't want a complicated background. You want to like get these, um, solid backgrounds. I think they work best because in previous videos, it didn't mess up like that. So, yeah. But there it is. So this is uh, Loki Mimic Motion, a new workflow added to the pack. Thank you, Mr. Kijai. Thank you, Stable Stability AI, for your diffusers release. And uh, like I said, if you get all of these models, download the latest version of the pack. You can use your own generated characters. You can go outside or use a smartphone and just record yourself doing whatever you want. And there it is. Now you can direct your own motion. And like I said, with the isolation techniques that we've already looked at in the uh, deep dives, you can pretty much start putting together stage direction with characters that you've created. So that's pretty big. The quality is only going to get better. A lot of people use the expression, this is the worst it's ever going to be. And I do subscribe to that because, yeah, who knows? It could be tomorrow, next week, or a month from now. There'll be an even better way of doing it. But for now, this is the way and you can run it on your PC. Do hit the comments if you find some magic settings that give you like less than 12 gigabytes of RAM because there's a lot of people that want to see if they can get this stuff running on less memory. So please do share that knowledge if you did manage to get it running on like on an 8 gig or a 12 gig card because I'm sure a lot of people be interested in what your settings were. And that's everything that I have for you today. So once again, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.